Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I thought I would make a video on becoming an au pair because when I was in the planning stages and like honestly deciding if I wanted to be an au pair, I watched so many YouTube videos. I found them really helpful. So I thought I would make this video to share my knowledge and possibly help anyone who might be in the same situation that I was over a year ago now. So I was obviously an au pair in Australia and yes, I plan on going back as soon as they reopen their borders, but I happened to come home to visit family due to family illnesses. Australia closed their borders right after, so now I'm just waiting for them to reopen so I can go back. So yeah, I was an au pair in Australia, but this video will honestly probably help anyone who wants to become an au pair like anywhere in the world. It'll be dialed into Australia a little bit, but it will definitely be helpful to any country. So the first step you want to take is deciding what country you want to au pair in. And I honestly don't really know why I chose Australia. I just kind of always wanted to go to Australia. It seemed like a nice and fun and safe country. I obviously did research on the country to make sure it was actually safe <laughs> and all that. But yeah, definitely research the country. And then you want to look into what type of area you want to be in within that country. So whether you want to be rural in a city, in like suburb. When I originally went to Australia, I was very rural and I didn't think that would be a problem going into it because I grew up rural. When I got there, I realized that I don't really like living in a rural area. It's different when you are with all the people that you grew up with, your friends, your family, versus when you go to a rural area where you don't know anybody <laughs> except for your host family and making friends can be hard. In my opinion, the things that I like to explore, there's not an abundance of those things in rural areas. So definitely decide on what type of situation you wanna be in. And then also decide what type of family setup you wanna be in and what your ideal household setup would be. Whether you're comfortable watching young kids or older kids, one kid or multiple kids. If you feel like you need a lot of space, definitely go to a house that has a lot of space. If you feel like you really wanna be incorporated in the family and that doesn't matter to you, then that's fine. Also, I would take into consideration when choosing a family, mentioning if you have any dietary restrictions, so whether you're vegan or you have allergies, definitely mention that because some families are really open to that kind of stuff and some families are like, this is how we eat and we want someone that fits into our family's style. Then when it comes to finding a family, specifically in Australia, there's a lot of different ways to find families. So you can go through an agency or you can go through Facebook. I know in the US <laughs> that sounds kind of sketchy, just finding a family to live with on Facebook, but in Australia, au pairs are so common that there's groups on Facebook, there's an Au Pair Australia group, Au Pair Sydney, Au Pair Melbourne, um, all different groups. That's how I found both of my host families that I've been with. And just do your research on the family. If they say they own a company, research that company. If they say they work for this business, research that business. If you can find all of their social media platforms, research that, just do your research. But if you feel like you need an extra layer of security, I would recommend going through an agency. The only downside to agencies is that you pay a fee, the family also pays a fee, and then you're also paying for like the flights and your visa and all that stuff. So it tends to add a lot more cost, but that's totally up to you. If that gives you another sense of security, then go for it. Another thing you need to take into consideration is how long you plan to stay. So my original plan was to stay for a full year in Australia and possibly a second year, but I wanted to live my first year before deciding that. Um, and I ended up coming home just because of family health issues that I just wanted to be around for. So my schedule ended up changing a lot from what I originally planned for, but definitely have an idea of how long you want to stay in Australia and have an idea of how long you want to stay with, with each host family. A lot of au pairs only stay with one particular host family for three-ish months and then they move on to a different host family because that allows you to see different parts of the country in your year stay. But if you're someone who doesn't like change or you just want to become more of a family member then a lot of families also look for longer term placements so six months to a year so then looking into visas i in australia am on a work and holiday visa subclass 462 
and most au pairs are either on a work and holiday visa or a working holiday visa. It just depends on what country you come from. The thing about these visas is that you cannot work for the same employer for more than six months and you can't study for I think more than three months. I don't remember exactly but if you go to the Australian immigration website it has all that information. And then the other thing about this visa is that if you want to stay for a second year you have to do 88 days of rural work in your first year so that's three months I believe um, you have to find work and it's farm work it's primary industry so it's not like horse farms it's like picking avocados <laughs> so you have to do 88 days of that in order to be eligible to apply for a second year visa so if you want to stay for a second year, definitely take that into consideration because if you're not someone who is going to be working on a farm, then you're not someone who's going to be staying for a second year. So when applying for this visa, I had to prove that I had at least 5000 Australian dollars in my bank account. I needed to prove my passport, so you send a picture of your passport. You need to have another separate passport picture that they attach to your visa. I had to have my birth certificate, immunization records, my high school diploma, and I think that was it. And I don't know if it's because I was from the U.S. and they don't do a ton of background checks for the U.S. or what, but I got my grant notification before I even got the received application notification. So they send you an email and literally as soon as I hit submit on my visa application, I was granted the visa. Which I feel like is weird because they obviously didn't do any background checks on me, but whatever. It's definitely different now with the pandemic and everything, but at some point I assume it would go back to normal. Pretty sure it says online that it can take like three months to have your visa granted, but mine definitely didn't take that long. But to be safe, just do it as soon as possible. And there is a fee. I don't remember what the fee was. I feel like it was like $400. Just make sure you have all the information required when you submit it. That way you don't have to submit it multiple times. Once you have your visa and your host family picked out, then you can schedule your flights, which is really exciting. And they can be pretty expensive, especially coming from the U.S. because it's literally the other side of the world. But if you're staying there for a full year, although it's expensive, it's worth it. I would also recommend making sure you have travel insurance. So my normal U.S. insurance covers overseas emergency care. So if I had an emergency and I needed to go to the hospital or whatever, I would pay out of pocket for the treatments and then I could submit a claim and be reimbursed. But I also have travel insurance. I haven't actually had to use my travel insurance at all, thankfully. <laughs> but when I bought it, I made sure that I had a pretty high maximum amount and no copay. And also covers if there's natural disasters and if you lose your luggage and just all kinds of other things that are just nice to know that you have insurance for. So I recommend buying that. I also bought flight insurance just in case something went wrong with my flight specifically. But I've also heard that if you have travel insurance you don't need the insurance that comes with flights but I would do your research because that's kind of a long flight and an expensive flight to not have insurance on so it's just nice knowing that if you miss a flight that you don't have to pay for another flight it's just all taken care of something else you should consider when looking for a host family is if they require driving and if you feel comfortable driving in a different country. So Australia obviously drives on the left side of the road and America drives on the right side of the road and you're on the other side of the car. So it's definitely something to get used to, but it's not impossible to get used to. When I first moved to Australia, I was driving manual. So I was shifting with my left hand. I was driving on the left side of the road and it was so different, but I got used to it within the first like three days and now I've come home to the US and I've gone back to Australia and then I've come back to the US and adjusting to the different sides of the road and the different sides of the car after you've already done it isn't hard at all. So just take that into consideration and then for your license, make sure that your license is in English because it's required in Australia. With US license at least they require an international driver's permit, so I just went to AAA. It lasts for a year. It's just like this little booklet that you give them your information. Um, basically, I think this is more important for countries who have licenses in different languages because 
if you get pulled over the police officer needs to be able to read your license um but that's just an it was really cheap and that's just an extra sense of security to know that if you get pulled over you're not going to be in trouble but i haven't been pulled over and I haven't had to use it so hopefully I never do. Another thing to organize is how you're going to get from the airport to wherever you need to be. So if you are going directly to your host family you need to figure out if they're going to pick you up from the airport or if you're going to Uber or take public transportation or hire a taxi or whatever your plans are. So the first time I went to my first host family they picked me up from the airport and we went straight to their house. So then my second host family I flew from one area of Australia to Sydney and that host family also picked me up from the airport so that was pretty easy. Also when I came home from Australia and then I went back I just decided to Uber because they were working. I knew the area. I was comfortable. There was no sense in having them drive all the way to the airport when they're working. So having a phone that you can use when you get to the new country is definitely important because you probably won't know the area, you won't know where you're going, and you'll need to contact whoever's picking you up from the airport. The first time I went to Australia, I had my international data and calling and texting turned on on my US phone. And then after I had been with my host family for like a day, we went to the store and I got a sim card like an Australian sim card but another way around that is to just buy a sim card in the airport because they have Telstra and Vodafone and all the other big phone carriers in Australia they have stands in the airport so you can just buy a prepaid sim card and I have a prepaid sim card so now when I go to Australia again I'll just put my Australian sim card in my phone on the plane ride over and I can just refill it in the app on my phone just like add more charge to it so that's a really easy way to just have an Australian phone number and it's like a lot cheaper than getting a whole plan. It's also really important to set up a Australian bank account. In Australia they have like I think three or four like big banks that pretty much everyone uses. They don't have as many little local banks like the US does so I would recommend doing your research making sure you figure out which bank is best for your needs and setting up that bank account it's really easy and that way when you get paid you have a place to put your money and a debit card and yeah it's just it makes it a lot easier so yeah that was a basic rundown of becoming an au pair specifically in Australia I hope it was helpful to anyone who is looking into becoming an au pair it's so much fun it's literally the best way to travel ever because you're getting paid or you're living for free to travel and see all these different parts of the world. It's so cool. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and I'd be happy to answer them. See you next time.